90% of professional fund managers can't beat the market. So why should we try? I get told this pretty much once a week every time someone new watches a Ben Felix video. And so many people leave these comments, but I've never actually seen where this figure comes from. So today I'm gonna go out and find it and see if it's actually true. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome back everyone, my name's Paul. I'm new to investing and I've started a dividend reinvestment portfolio on Trading212. Get yourself a free share in the link in the description below if you wanted to sign up. And my portfolio is very evident that I have a lot of individual stock. And while I do invest in broad-based index funds, I don't invest too much, it's more of a token amount. Right now, like lots of many retail investors, I'm beating the market. But over the long term, apparently the odds of me keeping that up are very, very slim. That's because those guys are professionals, they come from ridiculous schools, and I'm investing from a device that I use 50% for looking at stocks and 50% for looking at porn. At the close in the New York Stock Exchange, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 0.12%, while the S&P 500 index fell 0.46%. And when other YouTubers are leaving that comment on my video, this is the study that they're quoting. This is the Spiva US scorecard. This is where all of that data comes from that suggests that 90% of professionals do not beat the market. And the first thing that jumps out to me straight away is that over the past 20 years, the failure rate of funds has never actually reached 90%. The highest seems to be in 2014, where it reached 86% or 89%. I can't tell. And on average, over the past 20 years, it seems to be very much like last year, where funds achieved around a 57% failure rate. Don't get me wrong, I still think that's pretty high, but it's not 90%. Over the past 20 years, the number actually seems to be about 60%. And if you break down the specific funds in relation to their specific indexes, it actually gets pretty good there as well. Real estate funds over the past two years have achieved a very respectable 26% failure rate. And for the past four years, mid cap growth hasn't done too bad either. And then we have to consider if all funds are actually trying to beat the market. For instance, take my parents. They've built up a little nest egg over their years and now they want to protect it. For example, you can take my dad. I know for sure that he has specifically gone to his financial advisor and asked them to protect his money rather than make it grow. And I imagine there are thousands and thousands of other people out there with exactly the same goals as him. So his money isn't going into any form of high growth portfolio. He's just trying to beat inflation so his money stays relatively safe. So that could be a goal of some of these investment funds. Sometimes they don't want to beat the market so they can mitigate risk. Now I'm definitely not a fan of mutual funds. I would much rather be in an index, but I'm willing to defend them when they're being misrepresented. But it seems that every single excuse that money managers have for failing against the market all come down to one thing. And it just so happens to be the same reason why I hate mutual funds, fees. Mutual and managed funds tend to charge a lot of fees, much more than an index fund would. And in order to get those fees, money managers need to perform. One excuse for their failure, believe it or not, is professionalism. Because everyone in the world, including some of the retail investors, have got so good at investing, there's no one to take advantage of. These guys believe that they are all so, so smart that they are competing against only each other. Every time that you click buy or sell in Trading212, you are actually buying or selling a stock to someone else. And apparently when all of the money managers know exactly what the best stock is to buy, they can't get it from everywhere because no other high quality institutional investor is gonna be willing to sell you a stock that's actually really good. It's like putting two high quality football teams against each other, having them go 90 minutes plus extra time and then having to finish it all on penalties. Someone is always going to win, but it ain't gonna be by much. I do find it acceptable that active managers do need to consider risk though. If your fund is considered lower risk and there is a big crash and it loses more than the market, then people are gonna start withdrawing their money. Your fund then loses fees and you eventually end up out of a job. But this risk management thing is possible. You don't have to just buy an index. For example, in 2008, you could have bought the S&P 500 here on the orange and still made a ton of money. 
However, you could have mitigated your risk and lost a lot less money in the crash and still made exactly as much later in 2020 just by having a portfolio that is 60% stocks and 33% bonds. This is a classic risk management strategy that has been used for decades and it worked very, very well in 2008. I'll give them that one. But to keep you involved, active fund managers need to be very active. ARK Invest is a great example. They publish all of their trades on a daily basis. Do you think they do that because they want to be really transparent and tell the world exactly what they're doing right before they do it? Or do you think they post that every day to keep you excited that they are buying lots of different things and also to make it look so complicated that you couldn't possibly do it yourself? Call me disruptive, but I'm leaning towards the latter. And for a normal person, all of this constant rebalancing is a recipe for disaster. Being so focused on the short term, trying to get those exciting results usually ends up in failure. And most people, including Ivy League professionals, generally fail at this. The greatest advantage that retail investors have is that they can focus on the long term and not have to focus on impressing people in the short term. Retail investors can buy very high quality companies for a very long time and not have to worry if it underperforms for a few years. In fact, there's a surprising amount of evidence that you don't really have to know what you're doing. If you're forced to pick stocks at random out of the 7,000 on the CRISPR database, your picks are more likely to be weighted towards small caps because there's a lot more of them. That would mean that you have higher potential growth and often beat the market. The studies also show that if you just know a little bit about what you're doing and are willing to hold for the long term, any strategy such as dividends, cash flow, book value, price to sales will all outbeat the market. You could even pick a low beta strategy which isn't as volatile as the market and still beat it. You can also pick the absolute inverse of that, the highest volatile strategy, and you will outperform the market as well. The reason why all of these strategies outperformed was because they were held for 42 years. So that's my plan. It seems that actual stock picking, as long as you're not absolutely stupid with it and you do buy companies that are more likely to be relevant in the future and just not speculative bets, it does seem that the most powerful tool in investing and the way to beat the money managers and the index funds is to simply hold high quality stocks for a very long time. And that's how I plan to go forward with my portfolio. My portfolio currently sits at 32,840 and it's a dividend reinvestment portfolio. Dividend reinvestment and dividend growth has proven in the past that it beats the market. And this is not because dividends and dividend compounding is what's going to solely bring that big wealth. It's because over the years, dividend reinvestment and dividend growth companies have historically beaten the market because they tend to be the highest quality companies. Oh, damn, are we going to bring back a surprising feature? I think we are. <laughs> Time to bring back an old feature, and it's the return of Is It Shit? I am so happy Is It Shit is back. Today, I've got three companies that have recently been in the news, and I'm here to ask, is it shit? First of all, Chinese commerce firm Alibaba. Is it shit? Alibaba is growing at a stupid rate, like 70% a year. Do we believe that? Are Chinese companies reputable? Who knows? That's the problem. And it all comes down to this man, Jack Ma, who looks like he's been kept in a cupboard through his formative years. Now China's put him back in that cupboard so he can't make any more shitty movies and everybody is worried. And we have no idea if any of this is actually true. All of this information is just fed by our media, so we could be under as much control as they are. If you look at the numbers and believe them, this stock is so undervalued, it's absolutely crazy. But if you're a tiny bit racist, then this stock isn't for you. I'm not racist, but Chinese people are really... <laughs> Moving on quickly, Boohoo is the sound you make if you're investing in this company. It's also the sound you make if you're one of their modern slaves making their clothing. Modern slavery or not, look at that revenue growth. Absolutely crazy numbers. But Boohoo is a British company that cannot keep its ethics together. It's been accused of modern slavery, it's been accused of fudging numbers, and now it's being accused of false advertising. With that revenue, Boohoo isn't shit, but keep a sick bucket nearby. And finally, Palantir, a stock that I have absolutely no idea what it does. I'm sure someone does, but I don't think it's you. We do know that Palantir hasn't made a profit in 15 years, and according to Trading212, has a profit margin of minus 106%. Everyone's big on Palantir because apparently data is the new goal. That's an extremely common phrase that everyone is batting around at the moment. 
I'm wondering if these people came to that conclusion themselves or were fed it by Palantir through the YouTube algorithm. Think about it, that's very possible considering what Palantir does. Or doesn't do, I don't know what it does. But many people think that Palantir is a software company when it's very heavily reliant on human interaction. This is the main reason why it's not profitable. And I really don't like that they're investing in SPACs in return for these SPACs using their products. That seems like a dodgy way to grow. Is Palantir shit? I don't know, and neither do you, because they can't tell you. It's probably a good odds gamble, but it's still a gamble. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. And if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and invest.